So greetings and welcome everyone to another episode of Oral Pathology Tuesdays. This time we have a technology review on the research arm. And of course the technology is something we have had in our, on our minds for quite some time and that is artificial intelligence. In a very human and typical way, we have uh, allowed AI to enter our houses, our lives, our works, uh, even our cars nowadays, but we are still having a lot of questions when it comes to how to use it otherwise. You know, we have Siri, we have Alexa, we have Cortana, and we have the not so well-named Google Assistant. Uh, and I probably just got all of them activated. So maybe there is a, no, okay. Maybe there's a huge jump in the data transfer. But anyway, there are a lot of questions that remain. And today with us, uh, we have, uh, yes, we have Elmer Gomes, a type, who has an experience on both sides, on the technology side and on the medical side by virtue of what he is doing. He is a PhD researcher in the Department of Radiology and Nuclear Medicine, but yes, he has also worked on pathology slides. And uh, he is from the Inca Application -deri uh, Driven Research, Otto Wen Gericke University Medical Faculty, Germany, and I hope I got that name right. He works together with clinicians from the Department of Nuclear Medicine to develop computer-aided diagnostic tools for the classification of thyroid cancer using ultrasound imaging and AI. And he has also worked on many other projects. And he is the co-founder of MedInShare, which is a resource allocation and optimization platform that assesses the lack and need of medical equipment and facilitation distribution uh, to centers that need it. Now with that, I shall stop share and get everyone on board. We also have other guests with us and uh, they are all going to be, yes. Can I request, yeah. can I request all of you to please put on your cameras now? Yes, yes, good morning everyone. Yes, we have with us Elma who is the speaker. Hi, Elmer, welcome. And we Hi. have, Hi. yeah, we have Tilak Ratnesa, who is one amongst us from the dental side or the oral pathology side, who has some experience in this because I think two of his PhD students are working on it. So he may be able to give us some insight at the end on what it is. And also, I hope you will be able to interact and find out more. Uh, we have Dr. Raghu Radhakrishna, who is the in charge of the International Affairs of Maha University. He is also an honorary member of Team Oral Pathology India. So he has been helping a lot and he is like uh, all the time there. So he is another person here. And we have Dr. Ravikant Maniam, who has also been contributing a lot to whatever we have been doing. And Dr. Smita, who is the editor of our journal of oral pathology. So we have quite a panel, we have, uh, and everyone, I hope we will get back together at the end and have a discussion uh, with this short hellos. I think we shall get on with it. And uh, yes, Elma, can you start, please? Yes, uh, it would be my pleasure. Thank you, Dr. Mandana. Um, so let me just share my screen. Yeah, uh, is it visible? Yeah, it's visible, it's visible, yeah. Okay, perfect. So uh, let's begin then. Um, greetings everyone, my name is Elmo and thank you for tuning in today. Um, I'd like to tell you what we are going to talk about today, but uh, before that, I think it is important to tell you why we need to talk about this. Um, as we uh, professionals and the general public bear witness to the fusion of the medical paths with technology, uh, it becomes abundantly clear to us that artificial intelligence is something that will have a very vital role to play moving forward. Um, the use of uh, technology such as this will definitely enable us to deal with more complex problems while simplifying processes. 
So without further ado, let's see how this is made possible. So today we will start by first uh, understanding what AI is and what it consists of. Uh, then we will move on to see what its current applications in the, medi uh, in the medical domain are. And we will then narrow our focus just a little bit and see how it can be used in imaging and pathology, uh, particularly for cancer diagnosis. Here we will also take a shot at trying to understand the process for developing AI tools. And uh, a short walk from there will actually lead us up to the list of things we would need in order to carry out uh, such development efficiently. Of course, learning through examples has proven to be much more effective. So uh, we will look at a few examples that exist out there and uh, we will uh, fo uh, follow this by understanding the benefits and drawbacks of this technology. Uh, lastly, we will conclude with a short summary that I bet is going to answer a question that is on everybody's mind who has tuned in today. Um, so let's begin. Uh, saying hi to AI. Uh, I'm sure that every one of us has watched movies or read books that portray AI in a way that uh, would make us think that this is definitely something that might replace us human beings in the near future. Uh, well, that statement is partly true, but you know, I think I'm jumping the gun right now and uh, maybe let's circle back to this question at the end of the presentation. Um, I personally believe that knowing the definition of something uh, takes away half the fear associated with the concept. So how do we define AI? Well, in the most simple, simplest terms, uh, AI can be defined as any technique that enables a computer to mimic the action of a human being. And uh, this, uh, this definition was, and the term AI or artificial intelligence was first coined back in 1956 by John McCarthy who was a cognitive and computer scientist. Uh, he's done some amazing things in the field and it's, uh, it's, his work is definitely worth a read. Um, well, in order to better understand what artificial intelligence is, we need to first look into what it consists of. So what are the parts that go into making artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence? So if we take a look at this, at the top, we have artificial intelligence, which in a broad sense means, uh, or is used to describe the way computers can mimic human behavior. Uh, then next, right below that, we have something known as machine learning. Machine learning is basically a subset of artificial intelligence, and it consists of the different techniques that enable computers to figure out things from the data given, it, uh, given to it, and deliver AI programs and applications using this information derived from the data. And finally, below machine learning, we have something known as deep learning, which is a subset of uh, machine learning. And it enables the computers to solve complex problems to be put in the most simplest terms. Well, of course, machine learning and deep learning also consists of certain subcategories such as supervised and unsupervised learning, but these are mainly concepts that depend on the type of in input data given to the network based and taking into consideration the desired output from this data. Well, I think it is safe to say that machine learning and deep learning together make up artificial intelligence technologies. Um, before we move forward, I would actually like to talk a little bit more about machine learning and deep learning, because I think uh, this is something that we would require uh, later during the talk in order to understand the inner workings of such systems and such technologies. So if I were to technically define uh, machine learning, right, it would be 
like so. So machine learning technically defined is the computer's ability to learn without explicitly programming it to. What this basically means is that I, if I have an algorithm and I, and I tell this al algorithm through a programming language saying, okay, listen, here's the data that you have. And um, you need to look at this data and tell, and tell me what exact, what more you can glean from it, right? So basically I'm telling the algorithm, I'm giving you a very limited amount of information and I want more information using the information that I have given you. So that is how I would define machine learning. And of course, uh, uh, deep learning would be defined as, or would be defined as something that enables the computation of multi-layer neural networks. Now, uh, don't worry, uh, neural networks simply put, or if I were to break down what neural networks are, is the, is nothing but interconnected nodes that share information amongst themselves to in response to the inputs that are given to it by the user. And this is highly dependent on what output you are looking for. <clears throat> uh, so now that we know, or we have at least a basic understanding of what artificial intelligence is, uh, let's take a look at what role it plays in medicine. So AI in medicine is applied to a number of areas, such as data collection, uh, processing and analyzing this collected data, uh, using multiple sources of data to aid in activities uh, such as uh, uh, diagnosis, treatment planning and assignment of new treatment plans, uh, follow-ups and scheduling, uh, optimization of workflows in healthcare facilities, which in turn affects the uh, efficiency of the management system in such healthcare facilities. And of course, also the translation of this into home and aftercare. Um, if I were to give you a few examples of such systems, one would be... Uh, of course, these are not limited to only these examples, but one would be laboratory information systems. These are information systems that basically use the lab reports and information obtained from lab reports to provide uh, decisions and classifications and probable suggestions uh, using AI. Um, <clears throat> then we have uh, patient aftercare and monitoring that uses data obtained from wearable technologies and sensors and uses AI on this uh, data to kind of monitor the patient's health and uh, uh, facilitates ongoing care. Then we have robotic assisted surgery, which I personally think is really cool, uses different branches of AI such as computer vision or uh, feedback and tissue characterization in order to enable a much more uh, efficient use of robotics in minimally invasive surgeries. <clears throat> of course, AI can also be used uh, for therapy that is both physical and mental and uh, something known as decision support systems. Um, now, today, as we speak about AI in uh, pathology and medical image analysis, cancer diagnosis, um, I think we should focus on one such system. And uh, this system would be the decision support system. Now, decision support systems or computer-aided diagnostic systems uh, is one that supports the clinician during the diagnostic process. As such, the data used by such systems can be anything from simple spreadsheets to much more complex videos. Well, in the field of uh, pathology and image, biomedical image analysis and cancer diagnosis, uh, the input data is most frequently uh, image or video based. So let's take a look at how and what exactly happens in such a system. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, most computer-aided diagnostic systems uh, used in biomedical image analysis and cancer diagnosis use either image or uh, videos as inputs into a deep learning uh, algorithm. As mentioned earlier, deep learning basically enables the computation of uh, multi-layer neural networks. Uh, the most frequently used algorithms in such a case uh, for image analysis are known as convolutional neural networks or CNNs. Now, let me walk you through the basic structure of a convolutional neural network. Um, what I would like to do here is try uh, to explain the inner workings of a convolutional neural network without getting too technical. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to be a bit presumptuous here and assume that everybody here loves puppies. Um, so imagine you are given a picture of a puppy. Cute. I, I know, right? Um, and when you look at this picture, uh, there are two types of information or two classes of information that this image possesses. One uh, is a class that is instantly visible to you when you look at the image. So it could be anything such as uh, the shape of the ears uh, or the color of the fur or the length of the tail or the height of the dog that tells you that this is a picture of a puppy. Well, um, these are the things or features that visually tell you that this is a puppy, right? So. The second type of information is something that is not seen by you visually, but it is something that is used by a convolutional neural network to identify whether or not an image such as this is, uh, of, that, is of that of a puppy. So that can be something as simple as the color values in the image or the RGB values in the image or something that is much more computationally complex. Um, and though this is invisible to us, these features are what uh, these algorithms depend on to determine and classify images. <clears throat> so if you look at how this would work in a normal convolutional neural network, the image of a puppy would be used in the convolutional neural network. The convolutional neural network will then extract these features and feed it to a classifier inbuilt and then tell you whether or not the image is that of a puppy or no. Something like this. Now, let's look at an example that's much more relevant to today's discussion. So consider an ultrasound image of a thyroid nodule. Um, in this image, <clears throat> we can see that right here in the center is a nodule, a thyroid nodule. Now, um, this image is fed into a convolutional neural network and the convolutional neural network looks for features that describe the type of nodule that this may be. Uh, so commonly speaking, the, ty the type of things that a convolutional neural network can be programmed to do is look for certain features such as um, the shape of the nodule or the definition of the margin. That is how defined is it? Does it have a smooth margin or does it have an irregular margin? Is it absent? Is it present? Uh, the ecogenicity, that is uh, how light or dark the nodule is with respect to the surrounding structures. Um, so the nodule could be either hypoecogenic, which is darker than the surrounding structures. It could be hyperecogenic, that is brighter than the surrounding structures, or it could be isoecogenic, which means it does not show any difference as compared to the surrounding structures. Then, of course, it looks at something like the orientation of the nodule, that is the placement of the nodule with respect to uh, the X and Y axes. Um, it also looks at... Uh, the presence of certain uh, compositional factors such as uh, cysts or textures such as solid or calcified uh, masses within the nodule to kind of identify what exactly this nodule could be or whether it could be either a benign or a malignant nodule. So 
An algorithm such as a convolutional neural network uh, can be programmed to identify features like this at a much deeper mathematical level. And uh, once it does so, it, is, it takes these features and it feeds it into a portion of the algorithm that then classifies the given ultrasound image uh, or of the thyroid nodule as either benign or malignant, something like this. <clears throat> so you may ask the question, um, what exactly goes into building such algorithms? Uh, to be very honest, I think we all know what the first first thing we need is going to be. That's right. It is data. How much data? Mm, well, uh, most deep learning algorithms require large amounts of data. And if you have to put it in terms of number, numbers or number of images, it would begin at a couple of thousands and go up to millions. Um, but to be honest, let's be frank here, uh, the more data you have for uh, operations like this, the more better it is. But uh, what if you don't have that much data? Well, uh, recent advances or advances in data handling in general, such as data augmentation, can help you overcome issues pertaining to insufficiency of data. And uh, one way that this can be done is uh, using co uh, conventional data augmentation methods. Yeah. Now, uh, con in conventional data augmentation methods, suppose you have, suppose this is your original image, right? Uh, one way to increase the amount of uh, data would be to kind of take this image and flip it, to so flip it, um, 180 degrees along the y-axis. Uh, yeah, and uh, another way to increase the data would be then to rotate this image uh, by say 90 degrees, 45 degrees, 180 degrees, but not 360 because then you would have uh, the original uh, image again. And that would cause data redundancies. Um, another thing that we like to do is we like to introduce foreign objects into the data uh, such as speckle noise, uh, what we like to call is blurring. Um, well, these are all conventional methods of data augmentation, but there are also machine learning based uh, methods for data augmentation. And uh, one such method is known at, uh, used is uh, known as uh, the generative adversarial networks or GANs. Um, what basically happens uh, in a generative adversarial network is that uh, you have two neural networks that work together to generate new images and uh, they compare these new images uh, to each other using the original input. So what happens is you have one network that takes the input data that sends it or learns from it and sends it to the next network and the next network generates new images, sends it back to the first network and then the first network checks, okay, how close is this to the uh, original input data? And if it's not close enough, it says, okay, you know what, you need to work on this more. So it sends that information back. The second network works on it a little bit more sends it back until it reaches a point where the network as a whole is satisfied or the conditions are met. So if uh, if you were to look at an example, um, here in this case, uh, the original image, uh, as can be seen from the first image, is fed into a network and then generates five instances uh, or five uh, new images that uh, are completely generated by learning from the information present in the original uh, image. Um, you can also take a look at this in the second image where you can see that essentially this is the same person, uh, but it uh, each image has different characteristics such as there's different in uh, complexion, there's different in lip, uh, difference in lip color, hair color, eye color, and background. Um, and Images like this, images generated using a generative adversarial network can act, uh, 
actually have similar properties to that of an original image. And studies have shown, particularly when it comes to pathological analysis, that uh, images such as these, though they have a very small uh, error margin compared to the original image, can be used for deep learning uh, in deep learning applications or development of deep learning models for pathological analysis. Um, now, once you have the data, it's time to move on uh, to the data prep or in technical terms, data pre-processing. Now, why something like data pre-processing needs to be done? Um, it's simple. It makes it easier for the algorithm to understand what it is you are looking for or what it is you are looking to obtain from this data. So we also kind of need to be aware of the whole concept of garbage in, garbage out. So if you just, if you do your, if you try to build your algorithm without actually prepping your data in the right way, you might not obtain the desired results. So uh, data pre-processing involves uh, activities such as arranging the data in formats that are acceptable to the algorithm, as I mentioned, uh, which includes the generation uh, and input of uh, ground truth or annotated data or the gold standard, as we call it. Um, it also includes the enhancement of parts of the image you want to analyze. Say, for example, you are looking at an image of blood vessels uh, in, in the larynx, right? Um, and you want your algorithm to specifically detect these blood vessels. So you use image processing techniques to kind of bring these blood vessels to the foreground, to enhance them just a little bit so that it becomes easier for the algorithm to recognize, okay, this is what the guy is looking for. This is what he wants us to focus on in addition to the ground truth. Um, and of course, it also includes uh, the preparation of the training validation and test set. Um, I would like to tell you a little bit more about training, validation, and testing sets, because I feel it is important uh, to know in order, if you are to understand the entire working of uh, a convolutional neural network or a deep learning model or artificial intelligence in general. Um, so let's look at one of the examples that actually helped me um, understand this concept when I was first starting out. Um, uh, I would like to apologize in advance for doing this to everybody so early in the morning, but uh, let's assume you have to take an exam. Like imagine you are prepping to take an exam, yeah? And you really want to ace this exam. And you say, okay, I really want to ace this exam. So I'm going to plan my, uh, my actions up until the point I have to take this ex that I have to take this exam. So you say, okay, Step one, I'm going to study for the exam. So you study for the exam using whatever it is you have available. So all the information at your disposal. So that would be your notes, your uh, textbooks, your online reading matter, your research papers, uh, online courses or coursework that you have done. Uh, step two, you decide that, okay, you know what? I've studied quite a lot. Um, I would like to see before I take the actual exam where I stand, because according to me, I feel I want to get above 90%, right? So um, let's, let's do one thing. Let's take a test for myself and let me see what my standing is. So I take a test or you take a test and you say, okay, hmm, uh, this test shows me that I'm getting only about 80%. Uh, and so you start thinking to yourself, what is it? I can do that will uh, make, or that will enable me to go from 80% to 90 plus. And you go back and you make these changes in your uh, uh, method to kind of get to 90%. And then you say, okay, now step three is when you actually take the exam. You go out there and you take the final exam. So if we apply this example to the actual concepts, um, the training set is something that would consist of all the information that you studied uh, in step one. Uh, the validation set will consist of all the information 
that you encountered during the self-examination uh, for which you used what you had studied, right? And the test set would consist of all the information that you encountered in the actual exam, which in all honesty is similar to what you studied, but not the same essentially. So when applied to actual data, it looks something like this. The training set is used by the algorithm to learn and identify features and patterns. The validation set is then used to evaluate what was learned in the training set or from the training set and improve the necessary parameters to obtain the desired outcome. This, uh, this optimization is known as hyperparameter tuning. Um, and the test set consists of the data that is not present in the training and validation sets and gives you the final performance of the algorithm. So as I, as I said, the test set consists of data, data that is independent of the two sets. It is similar, but not same. Um, if I were to illustrate this using an example, um, imagine you have 10 patients, you have data uh, from 10 different patients. And right off the bat, what you do is you split this into two parts. So you take eight patients together and you call this, this is one part of your data and you take the other two patients and you leave them aside. You say, I don't want to look at these guys for now. I will look at them later. Now these eight patients, so part one, uh, the part that consists of these eight patients, you combine all the data and you split it into two parts again. And you say, I will take 80% of this data and I will use it as a training set or 70% or 75%. And I will take the remaining 30% or 20% and I will use that as the validation set. So you have, so if you were to take an 80-20 split, 80% of your data is taken for training while 20% of the data is taken for validation, right? And then you train your algorithm using the training data, that is 80% of the data. And then you validate it on this 20%. And what you get is a final model, a trained model, as they call it. And then to this trained model, you take this trained model and you give, remember those two patients that you had left out and you said that you would take a look at later, you bring them back in and you take that data and you feed it to the trained model to actually evaluate the performance of your model. Again, so you, you see, uh, when it comes to the testing data, it is actually these two patients, their data was not part of the original training and validation data sets. So similar, but not same. <clears throat> and there are many ways in which you can evaluate your, or the performance of your uh, deep learning model or algorithm. Um, each, each method gives you different information on uh, how your algorithm performed and tells you different um, aspects of uh, how it understood the data. But the basic three things that you need that can be used are, uh, or the basic three metrics that you can use are uh, accuracy, sensitivity, and specificity. Um, accuracy can be defined as something that tells you how close uh, to the original gold standard that you had given the algorithm as an input your uh, final outcome is. Uh, sensitivity is the rate of true positive and specificity is the rate of false negative. And um, basically what happens, sensitivity, sensitivity and specificity does not necessarily need to be high. Uh, this is something that needs to be defined based on the problem statement that you are trying to solve. Um, at this point, I also feel like it's a good time to address certain concerns regarding uh, tech requirements. Um, so we all know, or at least we assume that um, the computational power required for something like deep learning is considerably large, right? So uh, as a beginner in machine learning or deep learning, you can always use services uh, provided by cloud platforms such as uh, Google Colab or any other service provided by GCP. 
Uh, Amazon Web Services also have quite a few things that you can use for the development of machine learning models online itself without actually having the need to have that computational power locally. And the same goes for Azure. Um, in addition to this, uh, what you need to remember is that uh, initially uh, the sign up is free, but then it costs a subscription fee. And if you uh, if you find yourself using these services more and more, you might realize that you are spending considerable amounts of money trying to develop uh, AI or ML models. Uh, and that can increase over time. Uh, another way of doing this is you actually uh, build your own high performance system locally. So you build a high performance PC uh, at your workplace or at home. And uh, this could cost you anywhere like starting at a couple of thousand dollars, depending on, you know, the, uh, the components you order or the range of components that you require. And of course, these components in, include, but are not limited to GPUs, RAMs, uh, so amped up RAMs, amped up storages, power supplies, etc. Of course, it all goes without saying that uh, in order to, uh, efficiently manage or develop AI uh, 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 products or applications or tools, uh, you would require a certain amount of uh, programming skills or experience or at least knowledge. Um, but well, with access to uh, the tools and resources we have for learning today, I think this is very much within our capability. Even as clinicians, um, with the help of something known as no code platforms, such as Google's uh, machine learning kit or runway ML or obviously AI, um, et cetera, uh, a seemingly impossible task or a seemingly frightful task such as programming doesn't seem to be that frightful anymore. And uh, of course, uh, you can use these to develop basic models for your, uh, for whatever problem statement it is you have. But uh, if you choose to have something much more custom or something much more specific, then you would obviously have to start diving into um, the use of actual programming uh, because that would give you uh, much finer control over the parameters and blocks that you can use and fine tune. But there is another way to do this without getting into hardcore programming or investing in high performance PCs. And believe it or not, it, it has been something that, has, that stares us in the face every day. Research collaborations. Uh, I kid you not, every... Every technical institute out there, every technical institute that actually works with stuff like this has one complaint. And that complaint is, I wish I had more data. I wish I had access to more data. I wish I had data that was more varied. You know, it's all about data. And believe it or not, like this is something that I too had a problem with. Like when I started out, it took me at least a year and a half to actually find data that I could use in my study. Of course, yes, you have public data sets and uh, data sets that are available uh, as part of challenges or global challenges. But um, we know that with actual, uh, with or with research per se, it's always about pushing boundaries and it's mostly about the collaborations that gets us quality research, right? Uh, and it's the same when it comes for the use of AI in uh, biomedical image analysis or pathology and cancer diagnosis. Uh, reason being the more voluminous and varied the data is, the more research can be done to optimize algorithms and solve certain problem statements that require a, cer a certain level of generalization. Of course, developing a a truly general model is not possible, but 
a certain level of generalization can be achieved. Um, let me try and break this down using an example. Uh, consider breast nodules, yeah? Consider uh, breast nodules or breast cancer diagnosis using ultrasound images. Now, <clears throat> if you have institution A, B, C, and you have ultrasound machine X, Y, Z, and institution A uses uh, machine X, institution B uses machine Y, and institution C use, uses machine Z, um, you've got data that comes out from three different places and is of three different types, though it is ultrasound uh, in nature. Uh, of course, every uh, company out there uh, follows um, the general law of ultrasound physics in order to obtain the image from the raw data. But every company does something a little different that impacts the final image. So it could be uh, using certain filters to improve the image quality or reduce the image quality or, you know. Uh, and these small changes kind of affect the analysis that is done using deep learning models. So, um, in a case like this, if you have um, these this varied data from these three different uh, machines and you collect all that data and you put it together and then you train a model that kind of generalizes features among these three types of data or data obtained from three different devices, then you can come out with a fairly general model for breast cancer diagnosis. <clears throat> and uh, something that's really cool uh, that uh, happened most recently was uh, developed by uh, the deep learning group at the Indian Institute of Technology in Kharagpur. And what they did is they uh, developed a way for using deep learning on your data without actually having your data leave the premises. So simply put, they developed a network architecture that trains models on your servers, does not take the data for them, it just trains the models and then you can use these models in your research per se. Um, and uh, this is being done for, um, more uh, three or more hospitals. I mean, they've put out the plan and it will be uh, presented at the uh, International Conference or the other conference of the International Society for Biomedical Imaging organized by the IEEE later this year. And additionally, you have several startups out there that are also cementing their positions in the AI-based pathological diagnostics world today. Um, a few such examples are, uh, say, Tempest. Uh, well, Tempest is a United States-based company that aims at being at an all-rounded operating system built for the fight against cancer. It wants to be the juggernaut out there. Uh, so it uses, what it does is it uses a combination of AI techniques together with pathological images, pathological reports, and oncological reports to provide a physician with, a, with an all-rounded diagnosis about um, the disease they are dealing with. It's mainly geared towards phys physicians and pathological data. <clears throat> um, another thing that is out there is Path AI. Path AI is also a United States-based company and is different from Tempest. Uh, in the sense that it is geared more towards researchers and it uses pathological images as an input and performs AI-based operations on these images to provide a kind of uh, classification of these images. Um, a company named Niramai, Niramai is a company in Bangalore and it uses AI in combination with uh, uh, thermal image captures uh, to provide a diagnosis for breast cancer. Um, this next one is actually, is particularly very cool, uh, I think, and it's called Skin Vision. Now, Skin Vision is a Dutch-based uh, company and uh, it enables you to identify the risk of cancer, that is low risk or high risk, um, using nothing but your smartphone camera. 
Um, I mean, apart from these, you have uh, newer players entering the market every day. You've got companies like uh, Aragon Biosciences that re that acquired uh, something known as Quantex that is used for the diagnosis of uh, breast cancer using MRI images. Uh, similarly, Vera Technologies also does this uh, for breast cancer using MRI uh, uh, data. Then you also have uh, uh, companies such as Chaos, Biomedic uh, Chaos Medical that uh, provide solutions for breast and thyroid cancer diagnosis using ultrasound imaging. Uh, similarly, large companies such as GE Healthcare, Philips, and Siemens uh, are making remarkable strides when it comes to integrating AI directly into their diagnostic machines or their imaging systems to provide diagnosis for like a wide range of organs. Um, so in all of this, what are the benefits and drawbacks of using AI in biomedical image analysis, pathology, and cancer diagnosis? Hmm. Well, uh, I would say let's start by looking at the drawbacks first, because um, let's get the bad news out of the way. Um, one of the main drawbacks is that due to the use of AI, you have a reduced human touch. Um, this is something, so it's this human element that uh, we find comforting during the diagnostic and treatment process. But the use of AI reduces this significantly. And uh, because of this, it also leads to a certain amount of social prejudice. Um, and because machines can't really understand us quite as well as humans do. Um, when it comes to the benefits, and you will see that the benefits definitely outweigh the drawbacks. Um, for one, AI creates accessibility for both patients and physicians or clinicians. Um, take for example, Skin Vision, uh, the Dutch company that we spoke of a little while ago. Um, this is something that is accessible by that is accessible to everyone who has a smartphone or uh, uses a smartphone on a daily basis and anyone can actually take it and uh, check whether or not the mole that you have on your hand is a low risk or high risk of skin cancer. Um, then of course, uh, it saves time in the diagnostic process and to a certain extent also reduces the costs incurred. Um, early detection and risk stratification of tumors is a huge benefit that AI brings to the table. And uh, we should also remember that AI to a certain extent is unbiased and hence it considerably reduces inter-observer variability. Now, all this together um, aims at reducing the overall subjectivity that currently exists within our healthcare system. This subjectivity, believe it or not, is what leads to potential delays, mismanagement, and sometimes misdiagnosis that could directly affect the health of the patient. And in all fairness, I think that is what we as healthcare professionals uh, aim to eradicate. So yes, um, the use of AI is a step in the right direction to reducing subjectivity. Um, now, uh, before, before anything else, let's go back to what we started with, yeah? And uh, coming back to the question that we uh, began with, is AI truly going to replace us when it comes to pathology and cancer diagnosis? Um, not to sound harsh, but yes, it is. Uh, but please don't misunderstand me. It is only to those who refuse to accept this as a change. I mean, naturally, because it is how things progress when change, uh, when change comes around, right? And uh, to those who accept this technology and integrate it into their daily functioning and who are willing to grow together with the technology, they would, ha would not have to fear being replaced. Because at the end of the day, we need to remember that healthcare is a very personal thing. 
and that works best when you have the element of personal touch thrown into the mix. Uh, whether or not AI will completely replace us in terms of being able to emulate this personal touch is a topic of discussion for another day. Uh, but as of now, what AI is meant to do is only support diagnostic decisions and not completely replace the ones that actually take these decisions, which just happens to be as clinicians. And uh, that's it for me for now. And uh, before we move on to the questions, uh, I would actually like to take this opportunity to uh, firstly thank Dr. Mandana and Oral Pathology India for having me for today's session. I certainly did learn a lot more while preparing for this. Um, I would also like to thank my supervisors, Professor Michael Friebe and Professor Michael Kreisel, uh, my advisors, Dr. Alfredo Iannis, Dr. Axel Bioza, and Dr. Simone Schenker, uh, all my colleagues, and of course, uh, last but not the least, uh, for uh, thank you all for uh, tuning in today. Uh, it was delightful, and I actually look forward to uh, the interaction that we have uh, now. So let's start with the questions. Thank you, Alma. That was a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. My pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot has been cleared. Let's first ask, I mean, uh, everyone who is on YouTube, uh, besides your questions, any of you feel less threatened by uh, by AI now? <clears throat> Medical AI, and you can put that in the chat. Uh, otherwise, so far we have actually had no questions. We have a lot of people who have tuned in and are saying hi instead of in, including uh, Elric. <laughs> hi, Elric. Uh, for everyone here, Alevik is Elmer's dad. Yes. Hi, Pa. And... <laughs> okay. And then we have Dr. Tabita, Dr. Sadish, Dr. Nandini, Dr. Arpan, and Dr. Savio, and Dr. Bindu, who are here and who have uh, typed in their names, so we know they're here. There are others also, of course, who have not commented. So let's get our own panel in here first and see what everybody has. Hello, everyone. Can you please turn on your videos? Um, um, on. Shall I shall I stop the share? Yeah, please. That would be nice. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> yes. So. What is uh, what does our panel have to ask? What uh, is it that you all want to know? Uh, thank you, Elmer, for that uh, uh, wonderful uh, uh, presentation. And uh, we are all uh, pathologists uh, in the group. So my uh, question was: So when you do the high resolution microscopy image of a human? Uh, issue section uh, for the computational purposes and uh, for the classification of the images, is it necessary that these images have to be digitized or even uh, a, a, a photograph from a representative area is just enough? Um, to be very honest, uh, digitization is preferred. I mean, the, although you can do a certain amount of or a certain degree of deep learning with the photographs itself, but having the actual data, it's always better to work with uh, DICOM data because you have information in there that is not usually present in JPEGs. Uh, but it can be done, but digitization is much more the approach that ought to be taken. Thank you very much. And, and I have another question following that. Yes, I mean, is the test data set, uh, should the test data set uh, be separate from the training and the validation data set? 
ideally yes um and uh let me let me tell you why it is actually important and i'm sorry i didn't cover it already but um so what happens with uh if the test data set is not independent is that um your algorithm could give you false positives you know because it already knows like it might come across an image that is in the test data set that it has already seen in the training or validation data set and it might go like you know what i know this so your accuracy automatically shoots up and that's not what you want you want to have a true representation of your uh, algorithm's performance and that only happens when you uh, use unseen test data I mean you can obviously you can always have um instances where you know you can use the internal test data split but it is always advisable to have a secondary or even a tertiary uh testing data set where you can test your final algorithm multiple times you don't have necessarily have to have just one test data set you can have more than one okay thank you very much Uh, anything else sagu i mean i have of course a lot of questions but i was just thinking that you know if the others can also come in and uh, or you want me to finish asking him questions first yeah you finish no worries no i mean i just wanted uh, also uh, elma to talk a little bit about uh, the supervised learning and the unsupervised learning when he's okay. applying the machine learning Okay. So um supervised learning and unsupervised learning very interesting concepts both. Um so supervised learning would be anything where you know what the what the final output is. So for example, if you have a test data set, okay? And um you have this in this test data set um to be to to kind of make things simpler, let's look at it, an excel sheet. uh in an excel sheet you have say 10 features okay this is an excel sheet that has extracted uh information or mathematical information from say nodules or from say um pathological images two different types of pathological images so benign and malignant images uh and you've converted this image data into um uh, well numbers like certain values and you have say 1000 rows and they are divided equally as 500 and 500 so 500 belonging to benign and 500 belonging to malignant and at the end you know as a person you know or as a profession you know that these 500 belong to the benign class and these 500 belong to the malignant class so uh, in order for me to recognize them or in order for the uh, for the algorithm to recognize them much more easily what i will do is i will assign a label to each of them saying that label 0 equals to benign and label 1 equals to malignant right so you have provided them with the label already this would be a supervised learning method now an unsupervised learning method would be is if you have 500 and 500 but you don't really know what is benign and malignant right so what you do is you feed it to a different kind of algorithm known as a clustering algorithm as opposed to a classification algorithm and the clustering algorithm tells you that okay these 500 belong to benign and these 500 belong to malignant so then later on you can actually assign okay now i know what benign is now i know what malignant is so now i can uh, apply the labels 0 and 1 it's just the absence or presence of this label that you can broadly think of it as supervised and unsupervised learning because supervised learning would take into account what you already know and unsupervised learning would basically try to tell you what you want to know so uh, the unsupervised learning is what eventually or or rather the unsupervised learning is the eventual goal of machine learning is it not necessarily not necessarily most most algorithms do used uh, do use uh, supervised learning 
but it depends on your problem statement then again right it depends on whether the data that you are obtaining is completely alien so what happens most of course you've got other types of learning such as reinforcement learning etc cetera, etc cetera, but these all fall under neural networks per se mm-hmm. and uh, if you see like the ultimate goal so nowadays what happens is when you look at deep learning in deep learning uh, if you have uh, uh, or when deep learning models are developed you take into account all the images you have so which is why you need large amounts of image large number a large number of images in order to conduct deep learning so you take these and you feed it to an algorithm saying that okay these are my images this is the gold standard or annotated data or ground truth okay and i want you to learn from these images and then i will test it on certain data now the goal is not to just test it on that certain data and end it right the goal is to have more test data coming in or to use the trained model on data that comes in now and in the future right so in such cases you have to have like the initial learning that was done was done based on supervised learning but say you uh, have a new data set or you have data sets coming in where you just want to see what sort of data is uh, out there or how this data can be clustered and classified so you take the data you put it into uh, an algorithm that extracts all these features and then you take these features and then you feed it to a clustering part of the algorithm that says okay this data could be this or this or this or this it depends on how many cl- uh, clusters you are looking for and that quite frankly the on uh, the method that you choose whether supervised semi supervised unsupervised uh is dependent on the problem statement you are dealing with it's not like it's the ultimate goal the ultimate goal is just to make things much more simpler to reduce uh, the margin of error and subjectivity in general that is why we use machine learning and deep learning or ai in general thank you can i just uh, chirp in a little bit there uh when uh, you say the uh, unsupervised learning with my understanding so far is that even the unsupervised requires a certain quantum of data yes that we are feeding it to basically yes. say that these are the general concepts or the general things that mark say a malignant from a benign and yes. uh, now you further apply it to this set and identify the patterns yes um in this case or in general why uh, these volumes of data are required is mainly because um uh, the more you give the network to learn from the more it can or the better it can learn it's just like the more you study the better you will do it kind or the more you understand from what you study the better you will do uh that sort of philosophy so that is why yes you do require a certain a certain quantum of data for it so basically the unsupervised data is the extraction of uh, some hidden patterns from the input data yes what is called features yes yeah and in fact feature extraction itself is a very vast vast domain and is um, is used in both supervised and unsupervised learning now um you can also have a uh, feature extraction using different methods not necessarily machine learning based or deep learning based methods but you can have say um signal processing based feature extraction or image based feature extraction using filtering using different types of wavelets or trans or uh, uh, fourier transforms that take these features put it in a data set and then you feed this to a machine learning algorithm there are many ways in which you can go about this uh like even if it's just image data like for example in my work uh, what i do is i use a combination of uh uh image processing signal processing and deep learning and then later on use machine learning for classification okay yeah so it actually depends on how you decide to go about 
um, you know, playing with your data. At the end of the day, you kind of like, as my advisor always says, you need to flirt with the data and you need to get to know it in a very intimate level to understand where you want to go with it. Yeah, this is a, a very new field for all of us, but then uh, I know that uh, it's going to be the future. And some of the papers that we have uh, also come across, I think uh, were uh, mostly before 2015. And after that, I think there has been a lot of advance uh, went in uh, the machine learning uh, and the AI itself. I think that's why a lot of earlier papers used to use this support vector model. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I still don't understand what exactly is a support vector. Um, model. Well, a support, so support vector machines are basically a type of a machine learning algorithm that falls under the subclassification of classification models. So again, it's a supervised form of learning where you have a data set and you have the labels attached to the data set and you feed it to a support vector machine and it classifies uh, uh, the two, like between these two classes. So benign and malignant. It's just a form of, uh, it's just one of the classification models out there. You have uh, linear regression, logistic regressions. You have, of course, support vector machines. Then you've got decision trees, random forest classifiers. Then you go into um, uh, like, aggregated uh, learning and then you go you can go further down into neural networks and the moment you hit neural networks that's where deep learning comes in and then again deep learning can use different types of inputs you can use uh, tabular inputs or like database inputs uh, and it can also use image based inputs and video based inputs and the deeper you go the more complex the network architecture becomes so it's support vector machines is just a type of uh, classification algorithm that exists. It essentially does the same thing as, um, as say a neural network used for classification, but in a different way and in a different capacity. Right. Thank I you. have one question from the audience. Uh, we'll just go through that. Uh, yes, there is, uh, Dr. Gupta is asking, you know, in uh, oral pathology, we have this machine called the Velscope that uses mm -hmm. fluorescence light for the diagnosis mm -hmm. of precancer and cancer lesions. This is not with a biopsy. It is just using it in living tissue. So uh, nowadays it has been that after the scan, it is uh, sort of uh, checked with the cloud. Somehow there's a uh, consulted by an AI. I'm not very familiar with this. I don't know if maybe the others are. And uh, what? how do you think that would work? I think um, it's eventually finally on images, but uh, yeah. Yeah, to be, to be fair, uh, Dr. Gupta, um, as long as you have the image and you know what you want to obtain from this image, it shouldn't be a problem to design an algorithm to do that. Um, because at the end of the day, uh, these images are so, you know, they're so they're packed with information that we cannot see. And every day there are new algorithms coming out that tell us how to extract these inf this information or these features, so to say. And the extraction of these features is what kind of makes it uh, possible to do whatever it is you choose to do with these images. So as long as you have the images and you know what you want to do with the images, an algorithm can be designed to do that. Can I pitch in? That's true. Yes, yes of course. <laughs> yeah, those actually images are, uh, you know, the DNA thing, based on the DNA content, it is converted into the chromatographical uh, this. So you have a, a green color, orange color. So based on the high DNA, DNA content, it reflects. So that is eventually captured and that image is processed further. So that's how you tend to uh, diagnose the oral lesions. Mm -hmm. The same goes even with our uh, cytology thing also. It has been applied very well in exfoliative cytology where they tend to, you know, uh, take a dye, a base or something like a 
fluorescent based thing and stain it and that was the chair side thing where they used artificial intelligence to interpret the whether it is uh, dysplastic or they, they try to grade that so till then uh, i mean that is a pre set data which is already given and that's how they have classified the dysplastic cells and graded them into grade 1 grade 2 grade 3 in oral lesions same thing but in a fluorescence uh, image they capture that and they feed it to the disc then image analysis will take place and later it will be segregated so uh, sir other than the, all this uh, can you just tell what pathology related work you have done at least in the cancerous lesions or something where oh pathology there, there's so much going on in pathology right now um we had a few projects where we kind of tried to develop um something that checked the grading done by pathologists and gave them feedback so okay. we used uh, uh certain pathological images uh, i'm not at liberty to discuss what yeah. pathological images they were but essentially we used these pathological images and um uh, we took uh these images we trained a model and then these images were graded by pathologists and then the model checked if the grading was done correctly and if it was not yeah, done correctly it's like more uh, it was objective sent back. quantitative yeah. and yes exactly yes. it was sent back and yes, i mean yes. this was one of the things we we did but in all honesty um, i don't deal with pathology images that much but uh, yeah some of my students have uh, dealt with it i had the privilege and exposure to this because uh, my work was also on morphometric analysis so okay. from then i pursued and one of the student from us had collaborated with me for the image analysis so mm-hmm. i had to send him a certain set of images to him and uh, you know i had to grade it and uh, later with this artificial intelligence whatever work he had done he gave the uh, you know corrections to that so basically in pathology as of now it can't be used for diagnostic purposes but definitely yes for screening and yes. it's already standardized yeah. by um, doing all this yes for example um like a few of the examples that i gave like tempus uh, mm-hmm. you should really take a look at what tempus does and tempus does something that is very it's a very logical approach you know it takes multiple inputs and then gives you a final output so it takes in uh, input from the images it takes in input from the pathology imp- uh, reports from the oncology reports from the doctors notes and then it gives you like a final uh, sort of diagnosis of the entire thing and that's i i i actually think that's a really nice way of going about things so uh, do take a look at tempus uh, do take a look at path ai uh, these are actually really cool uh, things that already exists out there and they are commercially available apart from that then you've got the university uh, uh, i know uh, that there is research being done on pathological data at the university in of innsbruck okay okay yeah uh, austria and uh, yeah as uh, but uh, i don't know the specifics of it but i i am aware that there is uh, research being done in that area okay, and um wait wait yes ma'am So go ahead go ahead smita uh can i come in uh, madam yeah please i think smita is sort of cut off yeah please have a cut yeah it's a great presentation um, talma uh, absolutely you nailed it uh, thank you thank you very much Uh, we started working with the uh, 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 one second uh, smita uh, i don't know if you can hear me your oh yeah okay i think she i think she's just sort of uh, caught off now yes yeah yes hmm. yeah uh, we actually started working with artificial intelligence in uh, forensic odontology so okay. that's a different uh, uh, aspect we we started working with our engineering faculty so uh, here uh, one uh, interesting uh, aspect which i come across during this uh, discussions and so on is the evolving nature of uh, the architectures 
so they mm-hmm. keep uh, changing over the period of time so now uh, when we start using the, right now we are using a vdg 16 architecture yeah cnn but uh, i don't know how long uh, that will remain as a standard aspect it keep changing so mm-hmm. the value when we spend a lot of time on this trying to bring out uh, some information uh, generate some uh, data and finally when we land up in nowhere like because it's a uh, fast changing it's uh, absolutely uh, in no time uh, new things are evolving so how how exactly uh, we need to plan uh, when we are actually working um i think i think you got cut off yeah we lost dr avikanto so this is yeah. a problem with slow speeds i i am not mistaken he is referring to the fact that i think our classifications keep changing uh yeah. ravikanto are you back yeah ma'am yeah uh, okay yeah. yes finish your question okay uh, please finish your question so i mean uh, how how reliable because i understand that uh, this is not uh, the field where one person keeps working it needs a uh, multiple disciplines and uh, Uh, in their own way of uh, contributing and mm-hmm. finally after uh, a particular period of time we are competing with someone on the other side of the world uh, when it comes to that particular topic so uh, uh, this is a serious question i'm uh, having from back of my mind uh, how exactly we do you know go about okay um well to put it simply um even though the architectures might change uh, the end result of what you are looking to obtain would remain the same now changing architectures don't really uh, pose that much of uh, a threat so to say because ultimately what happens is the problem statement that you are dealing with would require a very specific fine tuning of certain parameters let's take for example the vgg16 the vgg16 is a pretrained algorithm right it is used it falls under a class known as transfer learning so to say because you use a pretrained algorithm and you avoid all the excessive training times and you feed new data to this algorithm to see what it can do with this data now uh there are other pretrained algorithms out there that you can use and test and uh, this is this is all that comes uh, naturally during the research phase before you actually uh, and if it is what you are looking for is uh, a final product that you hope to release in the market but um, at the end of the day if it is just for internal use and if it is just if it is research based based uh, then changing parameters or fine tuning parameters in uh, models or in network architectures uh, are not that uh, complicated to do because uh, ultimately it would also depend on whether or not your desired output is changing and i don't think the desired output would change for over a long period of time the architecture might change over short, uh, like short term but uh, desired output remains fairly stable for a while and uh, to add that uh, one more uh, question now um, uh, we understand the data sets are very important when we start working with the ai especially yes. the larger the data the more the benefit i mean the output yes. is more uh, reliable but uh, do we have anything that at least the minimum of uh, so many uh, images or uh, the information has to be there to start with this um that's a ve- that's a question that has a very gray answer i would say um because ultimately to be safe a couple thousand images should work uh but if you don't have that then you can always resort to data augmentation methods that uh, we spoke of earlier which can be either uh, machine learning based or you know conventional data augmentation methods such as flipping rotation blurring scaling cropping there are so many things where you can actually take a small data set and uh, multiply it by a factor of n so depending on the different types of data augmentation methods that you use to go from say 100 images to 1000 images 
of course then, then, there is uh, basically image processing there is image capturing and image amplifying so in this image amplifying you can modify to any levels so whether yeah. <laughs> just the features can be taken yes yes so what yeah. is your take on since uh, artificial intelligence is uh, uh, you know is a substitute for human this so in diagnostic okay in treatment wise what do you think definitely it um, is useful in uh, radio uh, this craniotomy uh, surgery and all i i'm 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 sorry but um, i would i would defer in opinion when it comes to saying that artificial intelligence is a, uh, is a substitute it's not a substitute it's a it's an aid to be very aid. honest okay yes, yes. it's Correct. an aid okay. so yeah. it provides support so when it comes to treatment now i've not worked much with uh, ai in treatment but um, there is research that supports uh, ai driven treatment so it uses uh, the diagnostic input and suggests possible treatment plans the keyword here being suggests or recommends okay. yeah. you know at the end of the day it would be up to you as a physician or a clinician to say okay you know what yeah this makes sense you know this uh, i don't have to sit down and actually uh, break my head on coming up with an entirely new treatment plan um, the program has done it for me i can definitely take a look at it and say okay yeah you know what this makes sense for this patient okay considering that this patient is diabetic etc etc this treatment plan kind of suits this patient really well and uh, you've saved that time that you would actually have to sit down and come up with it because that task is done by uh, the ai in the program <laughs> because they are using this uh, very well for the uh, what to tell cranial, cranial surgeries and yeah. definitely uh, it is a guided aid so cryo surgeries and all their implicating through um, artificial intelligence if i may ask for a little bit of clarity on this uh, yes um, yeah. when you say treatment do you refer to surgical treatment no 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 planning also i mean what okay. you are saying that Yes, okay yes. so um yeah. when it comes to surgical planning uh, per se mm-hmm. um there are quite a few cool things that are being done so uh, for example uh, based on uh, where the tumor is located you know okay. they plan based the based on the skull yes. yeah it is they very difficult to path. approach yeah. path, path, but yes. uh, these Guided are the things pathway. yeah yes. so these are the things also that fall under the the uh, the umbrella of uh, decision support systems Sorry. because ultimately you are uh, taking um, you know aid from this ultimately <laughs> yeah ultimately uh, the craniotomy is an image guided uh, therapy right or is an Im- image guided procedure so Sorry. you would be using images in the planning phase in order to execute the actual procedure right So you have done work on this uh, radio nucleotide, right? Something you are um, you are doing right now. So my core is uh, ultrasound images. So I work a lot with ultrasound images. Uh, not because of anything; it's just personal preference. I I kind of like ultrasound. So <laughs> okay. No, if we have to imply that for our field in dentistry and particularly in uh, uh, pathology. i mm. have just come across many stuff like i'm i'm so sorry, sorry. We, we lost you for a while there Oh, everything yeah. gets your question could you please yeah. repeat what you said for pathology and dentistry in general uh, in general we look for uh, pathology definitely we look for you know uh, h hnd we call it that is a uh, uh, hematoxylin and eosin that only yeah. images we try to standardize so mm-hmm. anything with the face profile uh, any things uh, which can it be applied that will be of more uh, this yeah. i mean uh, to be very honest uh, ultimately it is image data yes that's what so, i'm trying uh, to tell you huh? yeah so it's for our, pathology it's, and for dentistry yeah dentistry. it's so it doesn't matter what modality it is but mm-hmm. as long as there's information present and um, 
and we know what we are looking for and we know what the gold standard is if it is uh, uh, available uh, it shouldn't be a problem <laughs> yes that is true. then that is the true. what is the errors uh, errors which can happen if you don't feed a proper data then oh wow <laughs> uh, <laughs> the errors that can occur yes uh, um to give you an error margin it can lie anywhere between uh, 0.2% to 25 <laughs> percent yeah. yeah it all depends so that's why data prep and data, data pre-processing is actually a very important step which uh, yeah. because uh, you know garbage in garbage out so if you don't actually <laughs> feed your network with the right data and the right form of data uh, yeah. you're not going to obtain what you're looking for which would Correct. obviously re- lead to a really large error margin and pathology is such that you know that's why this is not taken off so well in our field because of this problem only because we are not <laughs> able to <laughs> individual can diagnose based on many um, criteria but it can be used as a screening aid and differentiate into any lesions or anything but you can't come up with any diagnostic things <laughs> as of now <laughs> to be very honest we've we've experienced a little bit of uh, pushback from pathologists here yes, as well. yes. I, uh, Personally, also, I have worked since that only I've come to know a little bit about this. And I've thought it's not in our field. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we know, Dr. Applied. Smitha, that actually now there are quite a few already studies done. I think yes, uh, uh, Dr. Raghu will be able to tell us a little more. Dr. Khurram has done a study, I think, uh, you were telling me, right? And I yeah. think on oral yeah. pre-cancer. Yeah, we, we also work very closely with uh, some of our uh, colleagues here at MIT. Uh, again, uh, uh, it's all in its very initial stages because as uh, Elmer was saying that, uh, you know, what is that that you are looking to do out of these data sets? And I think uh, uh, the most important thing is data in all of this. And then uh, unless you give the right set of information to the machine, it becomes difficult for the machine to learn by itself what exactly it has to do. I think, I mean, this is where I think it becomes important for us to provide uh, the right set of uh, data sets. I mean, so in technology, no two images will be same. I mean, uh, as uh, uh, Elma was mentioning, uh, it's one, classifying and the second thing is segmentation. Yeah. And then they will deconstruct the image, yes. yeah. which is called uh, the patch extraction. So, and then, so you're, you're basically uh, uh, dealing with machines and you are dealing with somebody who is going to program something for a machine to learn. So I think, you know, it becomes important for us to provide the right set of data. I mean. It's just like, you know, when you say a mild dysplasia, no two mild dysplasias are similar. But then you have to define a set of parameters like abnormal nuclear cytoplasm ratio. So you give set of images where, you know, it is going to specifically pick this abnormal nuclear cytoplasm ratio and then learn that this is one of the parameters that the machine has to know for sure to call so some... DNA ploidy works very well. I mean, uh, anything, I mean, if you really see, I think you just also have to be intelligent enough to uh, provide the right set of data because I think right. all of us are curious to find out the answers that we would like. And I'm interested in knowing which of these submucous fibrosis transform into squamous cell carcinoma. Mm. And for me, to say just by looking at a slide, it is impossible. So if there is anything that is hidden, that and that a machine can extract, which will alert me that, look here, this is one of the parameters that you could perhaps consider, which will tell you that this is the case that will probably progress into squamous cell carcinoma. They're just not looking at the edge. They're also, I think, looking at some of these uh, uh, sections which are stained with specific markers. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it has really progressed to an advanced stage. And I think we have some catching up now. 
and i think i should really congratulate mandana for thinking about uh, elmer for this particular uh, uh, platform and then every time you know she comes up with something really novel and i think amongst all of us she is the most abreast with technology <laughs> yes oh, <no>. definitely <laughs> I I try but really it is yeah, it's now this I find humanly impossible to No and I think you know, uh, 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 as much as I am grateful to Elmer for this talk I think I also want to thank Mandana for organizing this Absolutely yes, absolutely. absolutely like this very was very educative actually, and uh, informative yeah. Thank you oh. thank you all so much and thank you for your support and it's uh, it's the support system that keeps it going really Yeah, many so, times, yes. Um, <laughs> like really, you. really, you are so energetic, and you know, you come with some diverse things. It's really, you know, <laughs> something um, we youngsters you. have to look for. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes. Uh, Mandana, can I just leave if you just permit me? Please. Yes, please. Yes, thank you for having stayed so long. Yes, and <laughs> see you. Um, Bye. <laughs> yes, Elma, tell me. Yeah, I would actually like to add to what. Uh, something uh, what uh, dr raghu was saying um so one way of looking at it is uh, thyroid nodules let's let's look at thyroid nodules right now classification of thyroid nodules is done by clinicians using something known as tyrads particularly when it comes to ultrasound imaging so tyrads is a standard put down it's the thyroid imaging reporting and data systems uh and it says that if a nodule has this 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 so if a nodule is say for example smooth boundary it has it is hyperechogenic it is uh it has a cyst then it could be classified as um a benign nodule right so this information can actually be translated or broken down into mathematic components that are then understood by a machine learning algorithm and just like pathological images no two nodules are the same but they have characteristics that you can use to classify them under a same class so these are the things that you actually need to look for Yes. Yeah. The finer details which the clinician can miss out can be seen through this aspect. Yes. And I think at the end of the day, what happens is uh, uh, the reason I think that uh, this whole system is going ahead more on the diagnostics, whether it be pathology or it be radiology, is because these are the two aspects which are image related. so at the end it's all about images whether you apply it here or you apply it there it's about the machine being able to read from an image a lot more than the human eye can read so yes. i think and and that that's the strength for us especially where we have a problem that we have very often uh, like you, uh, like smita very rightly said we don't always have uh, we look at the same slide and most pathologists will come out with very different ideas of the same thing but still we have those gold standards that that is from where we learn you know this this is the typical image of a squamous cell carcinoma and that's the standard for us and we all sort of learn around it but our perceptions while looking into a microscope may be a little different of exactly the same image but that is where the machines come into use and definitely will make a difference yes so uh, i don't know if dr ravikant is still there and whether he had a question dr ravikant are you around Did you finish your questions? Yeah, ma'am. I just have uh, one more. If you yeah, please. Yes, please. Yeah. Please, please. Now we will be. We are actually we are now discussing about the images basically. But I'm looking at uh, the videos. Can we actually work? I mean, like, in the sense how the exactly the work is going on um, in interpreting the video videos, maybe for a diagnostic purposes. Yes, absolutely. the computational power however would be much more uh, when coming uh, when it comes to uh, video processing but yes 
most definitely you can work with videos. You can also take the route where you break your videos down into images because a video is nothing but a collection of subsequent uh, image frames. So you just break it down into uh, image frames and then you start processing or working with uh, each individual image. But then, of course, it would also depend on the kind of output you're looking for and the classification on where the classification needs to be done. But there is a lot of work being done with the video processing uh, for uh, medical applications as well. Like uh, if you take a look at uh, most of the work done by the deep learning group at uh, IIT Kharagpur, headed by uh, Professor Deep Sheet, uh, he does a lot of uh, video related stuff as well. <clears throat> Oh, okay. okay. Uh, the reason why I'm uh, why I'm asked this question is uh, we had a recent discussion with uh, the faculty from other uh, colleges, where uh, we got an opportunity to work with the patients' uh, problems related to video and uh, applications of uh, AI. So we are very initial uh, stage at which we need to work uh, a lot before we actually start uh, uh, a project on that. Yeah. Uh, completely understandable, but yes, it is. It is most definitely possible. Okay, right. That's very encouraging. Yes. Yeah, so now, anyway, now that you have all got in touch with each other, I guess you can interact. And uh, I think Elmer would be glad. He he is one yes, of those yes, people, please. anyway, who is a natural yes, teacher, and also someone who really <laughs> likes this and is quite dedicated to this thing. So I think he will help anyone who wants to set up. Please, please feel free to uh, to write to me any any time. Uh, I would be more than happy to answer any questions. Absolutely. Yes, thank you so much. And uh, thank you everyone on uh, YouTube for all the comments. And uh, now I have something. Uh, any any more questions, by the way, uh, Dr. Smitha or Dr. Ravikant, anything, or shall we wrap up? Yeah, no, from my side, uh, that's fine, ma'am. I maybe in uh, I'll contact uh, Dr. Elmer maybe in future uh, if I need anything personally. Please, please, uh, by all means. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Smitha, your voice is off. I don't know if you're talking to us or someone else. Madam, you're uh, from my side? No, I, okay, Hello? Dr. Smitha's voice was off. Yes, uh, yes, Smitha. Oh, I'm actually on uh, endodontic, uh, this microscopic endodontics, they're doing this video thing. So that I came across, studies. Hmm. Hello? Yes, Hello, yes. Yeah, sorry, your voice is breaking slightly. Ah, sorry, sorry. My... Uh, Endodontics, the video company. on that they're working on an Indian platform in dentist. Sorry. Hello? Yes. Hello. I'm sorry, the network is poor. It was nice uh, interacting with you. I think I'll be in touch with you, sir, for fun. For, for sure, for sure. I would, it would be my pleasure to help any way possible. Thank you. I think I'll specifically work on a marker, and I'm interested in doing that part, not in the routine HD sections. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so now I shall just do a little share screen. Please bear with me. Yes. Is everyone Thank you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so, so much, Dr. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for being with us. Uh, thank you, everybody who was there and everyone on YouTube. And uh, well, now I have a few uh, more announcements. Please hang around while I finish those. <laughs> So one is, of course, if the, of the forthcoming uh, International Oral Pathology Case Presentation Webinar, which is turning out to be, of course, one of its kind because it has two organizations 
Uh, five colleges that are listed here. And of course, there is one more that needs to be added today into the artwork, and that is College of uh, Dental Sciences from Lavangiri. With that, it will make it six academic partners. And that's, uh, that is really rare, I guess. And um, so I would really like to think today is the last day for the abstract submission, but uh, please join in. Uh, you can register anytime till the date and I, we would like to have you there. The next thing of course is about the next week's oral pathology is on the update series. And that's from Professor Hazare. Uh, Some time back, he told us he was on the show and he was talking to us about periodontitis and he said he would like to talk to us about aggressive periodontitis. So that is next week. Please join in for that too. And with that, I have to say thank you everyone for being here, for making this a success. Always your support is what counts. Uh, if you have liked whatever you have seen so far and if this is your first time on the channel, please subscribe and please join us again soon. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having us, doctor. <laughs> thank you, thank you. It was lovely interacting with everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes, the live stream has ended. <laughs> okay. okay.